today. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'm okay with it. I'm going to record it. Um, today, we are introducing the mystery of the frame. We've got a bunch of stuff to go over that's all interrelated. Oh, oh, before we start, um, so the links that you send us through email, the Ratatouille videos, they're not available on YouTube. Seems like the account has been closed. Yeah, no, fair, fair enough. That happens every every now and again. So um, we'll watch that really briefly. and It'll become clear what it is that I mean by that um, pretty quickly as well as we kind of, or sorry, what I wanted you to get out of watching that clip as mm -hmm. well as we kind of go through the class. And um, realistically, it's still not really so important just yet, um, because as of next class, we'll start actually looking at clips, dissecting clips, right, seeing what kind of practical value those things have to the theoretical stuff that's coming out of my face, um, and spending a good chunk more time per class actually like looking at things. Right now, we're just kind of building up a visual vocabulary that we're all familiar with. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll take a look at that clip anyway and go to the salient parts of it. Okay. Show why it is that uh, I wanted you to watch it in the first place. Okay, great. Yeah, but uh, thanks for letting me know. I'll try and update that. Yeah, some clips are more difficult to find than other ones for, for some reason, especially as that uh, thing gets more antiquated, along with myself. Um, but one way or the other, what are we or what we're going over today? We're doing we're doing three different things today, all kind of geared towards the same thing, which is now gradually. Right, working towards developing tools towards right, visual storytelling, right? So how do you control an image as a way of directing not only or communicating not only the subject matter of what it is that you want to communicate, but more importantly, how you want people to perceive that, how you want people to emotionally react to that, or to that stuff. And perspective is a huge tool in regards to that. So one of the things that we're going to do today is kind of further the development of one point and two point, right? but with um, essentially starting to alter the vertical position of where it is you're looking at a picture from. So this is referred to as horizon line variation. And this essentially is like, do you want to move your audience up or down as a way of emphasizing right, not only the story, right, but the emotional valence of the picture in coordination with that? We're going to talk a little bit about right, how to utilize the crop for storytelling. Right? So how you take a picture and crop it in different ways as a way of effectively doing the same thing that perspective does, but in a slightly different way, in a much easier way. Right? And the effects that this will have, not only in terms of that, right, but also just in terms of like effective drawing right, for time management. And so for those of you who are really interested in going into storyboarding of any variety, this will become particularly important right? because there's just a lot of drawing that you need to do right? in that pursuit. And the more efficient you can be with that pursuit, the better. And then lastly, right? and closely related to both of these things, but specifically to this, we need to talk a little bit about the frame right? and how not only how objects relate to that frame, but also the nature of the frame itself right because there's different ways of talking about it right and there's going to be a particular way of talking about it in relationship to this class that's so upsetting my cats are doing unnatural things to each other right now it's not fun to watch um okay so from this point forward right your all of your drawings are going to have a frame around them right and let's just talk about this first right because it's It's kind of the start point of everything that we deal with. And it's easier to talk about both of these things, right? Actually possible to talk about this thing, but easier to talk about this, right? Um, when we deal with the frame. All of your drawings from this point forward are gonna be in this frame or in a, in a box. And that box, right, has a vertical component to it and a horizontal component to it. So all of your drawings from this point forward are gonna be inside a, a box like that, that's in its landscape orientation. Now that landscape orientation has what's called attached to it an aspect ratio. Now an aspect ratio, am I frozen for you guys? Oh, there you go. An aspect ratio controls the vertical versus the horizontal. 
Okay. Sometimes you'll see these things reversed. So it's important to know which is coming before what so that you don't mess up the, uh, the orientation of the frame. For purposes of this class, it's always the vertical first and it's always the horizontal second. Okay. Our aspect ratio for every drawing in this class from this point forward is gonna be three to four. So that means if you took this vertical, this vertical axis and divided it up into three equal chunks, that means along the horizontal axis, you would have four of those chunks. Right? This doesn't mean that these things have to be four inches and three inches or three feet or four feet. This means that whatever unit of measurement that you're using here, if it's three centimeters here, it's four centimeters here. If it's six centimeters here, it's eight centimeters here, right? So if fractions make sense to you, that would be the fraction, right? Of it, where verticals right, are relating to horizontals right, in that way. Okay, now this is important to underscore, right? Because say that you reversed these things and had the horizontal first, and the vertical second, this is a three to four aspect ratio, but this is in portrait. Portrait is no good for us because the four is vertical and the three is horizontal. Okay, so this is the most common way of missing or of, mix, or of mixing this up. This is totally viable as an aspect ratio for certain types of, or for certain types of, um, mediums, processes, right, endeavors, right, et cetera, portrait painting being the most obvious amongst them. This is no good for us. Neither is any of the other variations of aspect ratios, right? So the increasingly common widescreen, which better accesses or better um, utilizes the wideness of our field of vision for large viewing experiences like movie theaters, right, et cetera. Right, the truncated version of that, like a widescreen television, right, which basically takes that super wide, right, and then just truncates it down. Squares, right, that's another type of aspect ratio. None of these are good. The only thing that's acceptable, the universal sign for please do this, is this, right? So this is what's called TV format, right? based once upon a time when TVs used to be in this aspect ratio. This is still industry standard enough, right, in terms of talking about what this looks like and what it's utilized for, right, as well as still present, right? So I don't know if any of you guys have seen like the Zack Snyder cut of Justice League, right? Really interesting the decision that they make, even though it's presented in this widescreen format, they've essentially cropped out all of this stuff on either side of that widescreen and shown it in 3.4 or 4.3, however it is you want to communicate it, right? And I'm fairly certain, I don't, have an ask, I don't have an exact answer for this, right? But I'm fairly certain that the rationale behind this is because that entire thing, that entire movie is basically a throwback or a homage to the days of, the days of yore, so to speak, when those comic book characters had their heyday in 1950s, 1960s America, where they would have been presented for the first time in this format. So to present it in that format is making a historical and nostalgic commentary, right, on the origin of those characters, right, as they all come together for the first time, right, in that particular franchise. So it's a nice decision, right, because of an awareness of that particular format, right, and the history behind that. Now, I'm going to dilate on this, right, for a very important purpose. In relationship to your piece of paper, that means your piece of paper, whether or not you're presenting it in portrait or in landscape, your frame is gonna be drawn separately from that piece of paper and it's always gonna look like this. It makes more sense to draw it in landscape for obvious reasons because you can draw that thing larger. And it also makes more sense, right? Because that thing basically mimics the orientation of a regular eight and a half by 11, A4, right? Whatever type of piece of printer paper you wanna call it. Okay, so this doesn't have to be exact. I'm not going to be taking out a, a ruler and measuring this thing to make sure that it's perfect. Right? Basically, if it looks right, it is right. 
And if it mirrors the orientation of a landscape piece of paper, it's probably gonna be fine, right? So if you're drawing in a sketch pad, for example, and the rings of your sketch pad are up here and you draw your frame, something like this, that's totally fine for me. Okay? But I do wanna see a reference to the frame in all of your drawings from this point forward, right? Unless otherwise, unless otherwise stated. There will be very few examples or instances where that's not going to be the case, and I will make it known to you, right? If that is the case. Now, so does the reference that said the frame need to be equal as the frame? Like, I mean, like the top part be equal as the bottom? Like, you mean this space here versus yeah, this? Yeah, yeah. No, no, okay. not at all. Okay. So the page and the frame themselves don't have anything to do with each other, mm -hmm. right? Other than if you draw it in landscape, the orientation of the frame is very similar to the aspect ratio of the paper itself. Okay. okay. So don't confuse the two. Um, now I dilate on this particular point because if you give me this or this or this, your mark is this. Right? Because a huge part of this course is controlling everything about an image so that you can predict with a fair degree of accuracy how your audience is likely to react to what it is that you're showing them. And if we don't have a control even over the frame, then nothing else matters, right? The frame is the start point, right? And the French, ironically enough, right? I don't know why ironically, but oddly enough, I suppose, not even oddly enough, because if you understand <laughs> the of it, it makes a lot of sense why they'd be doing it. They basically did it, right, in order to differentiate themselves from the Italians who are a hege hegemonic power in the art and cultural world leading up until the 16th and 17th century where France took over dominion. Anyway, that's an irresponsibly short history of uh, aesthetic or the aesthetic background that we're functioning on. Um, anyway, the French introduced what they called the tableau right, at that point. And since then, the importance of the boundary has been a crucial part to understanding what, you would, what we would think of it as essentially image theory since then. Okay, so if you do something like this, which is again, the most common way of doing this, you're left with really unattractive options. One option is to do this, to superimpose this format over top of that, which means that you lose essential portions of the image. Another unattractive option is to do this, is to make that frame wider and incorporate the entire image, which means that you have these areas of dead space in your picture. And the reason that you get that disclaimer at the beginning of a movie that you're watching on a flight where this thing has been reformatted for your viewing displeasure, right? What they've basically done is taken something that's been composed for a frame like that and done this to it, right? So they've left the stuff that makes the movie intelligible, still visible, but they've gotten rid of the stuff that makes that image look good. Right? Because what you cannot do is design for this and for this and this at the same time. Right? It's not possible. Right? But what you can do and what we will be doing in this class is you can take the rules or the guidelines that are associated with a format like this and apply it equally well to any other format. Right? So it really doesn't matter what format we're using because right? the rules that we're going to be going over right, are going to apply equally. And certain formats, to be fair, are going to be more appropriate to accentuate some of the ideas that we go over than other ones. But we're locking this thing in as a standard so that everybody's dealing with the same thing. Okay, so I want to make sure that everybody understands this so that I don't have to give this to anyone. But there's always one of you fuckers like at like week, week 13, right, that does something like this because it's so far in the rearview mirror, right? And I'm hoping that uh, this conversation helps to, you know, make that a distinctly distant possibility. Um, it doesn't really happen all that often. It used to happen at least once every every class. Now it happens like once every three or four classes. So maybe I'm just getting better explaining the importance of this particular thing. Anyway, any, is everybody clear all right, what I mean by that? All good. Okay, great. All right, so one of the things that you're going to have to do is you're going to have to crop an image, right? And I'm going to ask you to crop an image in a couple of different ways. I want you to crop an image with the horizon line below the frame. I want you to crop an image with the horizon line 
above the frame. And I want you to crop the same image again, diagonally. These things all have names. What? Yeah, get in frame, nice. Okay, when we crop the horizon line below the frame, what we're doing is creating a high crop. When we crop the horizon line above the frame, we're creating what's called a low crop. And when we, and when we crop the frame diagonally or crop an image diagonally, regardless of where the horizon line is, this is what's called a Dutch tilt. Because essentially what we're doing with images with perspective is we're developing a spectrum. Right? At the spectrum, right, we're develop or and the spectrum that we're developing is between the extremes of what's called an extreme upshot and extreme downshot. Right? And then somewhere in between them is at least hypothetically a perfectly eye level perspective. Now upshots are alternatively referred to as low angle shots, which is confusing. One is, they're both industry standard, which is equally confusing. One is a film term, one is a, as an animation term. Right? They both refer to the same thing. So I use upshot because I have a bit of an animation background as opposed to right, a peripheral relationship with film. Whereas Chad, when you get into your film classes with him, will be using low angle and cursing my name because you're familiar with this. Right? Upshot means that you're looking up at something or it feels like you're looking up at something. A low angle means that the camera or a person is in a low position looking up at that thing. Right, so not surprisingly, a downshot means that you're looking down at something, right, or alternatively is referred to as a high angle shot. Right, so you've got a person in a high position looking down at something. Whereas an eye level basically refers to an audience's eye level, an audience's horizon, where that horizon line is inside of a picture. So a perfectly, a theoretically perfect eye level shot has the horizon line directly in the middle of the frame. Okay. And as we move towards an upshot, I can still have the horizon line in the frame, but now I move the horizon line down, right? Which moves your eye level shot, right? A little bit more towards an upshot. And likewise, if we go in the opposite direction, we can move the horizon line up in the frame, change the eye level of the audience, right? But now start to inflect a downshot. So when we move the when we move the, the crop up enough to that position, right? What that means, so this is your high crop. Your horizon line still exists, but your horizon line's out of the frame. And likewise, if we move the frame down enough, your horizon lines above the frame still exists, right? But now further accentuates a downshot, right? Because what these crops are designed to do and why you would choose between them is to convey different emotional points of view, right? Different types of things. Right, so these aren't arbitrary aesthetic decisions, right? Ideally what they are, I mean, they can be arbitrary aesthetic decisions, but the whole point of this course is that they're not arbitrary right? and that you're making decisions based on an, an awareness of what these decisions, um, what the consequences of these, these decisions are. The emotional characteristics of an eye level perspective is that you wanna communicate a sense of stability. Right? And stability for a variety of reasons. That might be most obviously geographic stability. Right? You're not in a place where there's a tsunami or a volcanic eruption or an earthquake happening. You might want to communicate psychological stability. The people that you're talking about aren't fucking crazy. Right? They're not loose cannons. Right? They're not likely to murder you. Right? 
in the next scene. You might right, want to have stability simply because you have an important dialogue scene that you want people to concentrate on and not be distracted by anything else. You might have an important dance choreography or fight choreography or fight sequence or action sequence that you want people to pay attention to. You might just have cool shit happening that you want people to pay attention to. Say you spend an enormous amount of money on some fucking amazing 3D animation or special effects that you want people to pay attention to rather than the perspective that you're showing their shit in. All of these things are valid reasons for creating a sense of stability inside of a picture. What this also means is that as soon as you get rid of that horizon line inside the frame, you start to get rid of that sense of stability. The reason that that sense of stability is created is because of a sense of familiarity. When we look at stuff, our eye line is inside the frame. Like when I'm looking at the camera, it's like I can only look at something right with my eye level present in that. And the more reflective that that familiarity is of the way that we generally look at the world, say just looking straight ahead so that we don't bump into shit while we're walking around, right? Like fuckers with a phone, right? Is it, that's increasing right more and more on a day-to-day -day basis. Like this, right, doesn't allow you to engage with the world where things are familiar enough for you to not bump into them. So when we start to approach this, it starts to create this because we recognize all that stuff. Right? And as a result, we don't really pay attention to anything right, beyond what it is that we're looking or what we're looking at. Now, as we start to lower the horizon line, raise the horizon line, right, these things are going to start to become a little bit less familiar. But essentially, the stability that's associated with an eye level will still be present and it'll start to take on the characteristics of an upshot or a downshot, respectively. Those characteristics, and here's another chunk of terminology for us as we get into upshots. These things are called dominant perspectives. Where, where these are called diminutive perspectives. Now, these things do exactly what they sound like they're supposed to do. These are in the service of making things feel powerful, strong, Right, so maybe strong is a better way to put it. But power is a, a good equal way. These things are in the business of communicating weakness, right, or vulnerability. Attach whatever son, synon, synonym, synonym, attach whatever synonym you want to these things, doesn't matter. These things are superior, these things are inferior. These things are in control, these things are out of control. These things are strong, these things are weak. These things are winning, these things are losing. Okay. And basically, as you start to slide down the spectrum or slide up the spectrum, as you move away from this hypothetically perfect eye level perspective, all you're doing is basically moving to more extreme versions of the same characteristics. The characteristics don't change, they just become more of those characteristics, right? More strong, more weak, right? More in control, less in control. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Right, and we're going to be doing a lot of this as we kind of move forward. Okay, so one of the things that I'm going to ask you to do, right, for your assignment. Actually, this is a. Keep forgetting that this is a thing that I do now. If you guys want to screenshot that, that's a good. That's a good page to screenshot. The HC and LC is high crop and low crop, right? You got it. And it's not like this is going to disappear into the background. Like I'll be reviewing this again next class as we add more elements. The next two classes, actually, as we add more elements, right, to that spectrum. What I'm going to ask you to do for purposes of your assignment is that. I want you to create one drawing or four drawings out of one drawing. And so if this is the frame of your drawing, okay, and for purposes of this assignment, let's say that this is my piece of paper. 
to make this crystal clear how these things relate to each other. If this hasn't already become evident to you, right, what I want you to do in, your, in this drawing is place the horizon line in the middle. in the middle of the frame. Right? And I want you to put your vanishing point, your one point directly in the middle of that frame. And then I want you to put your two point vanishing points as far out to the side of your piece of paper as possible. So for those of you, right, who have kind of like discovered the pain in the ass distortion can be when you start dealing with perspective objects, this will minimize the amount of distortion that you experience. The further these things are away from the edge of the frame, the less distorted your objects are gonna be inside the frame. Okay, so this is, this is a small thing, but it's an important thing. You know, one thing that you can do as a way of also making your drawing easier is you can give yourself some perspective lines. These are just really light lines that come off of all your vanishing points and direct visual traffic above and below the horizon line perspectively. So that would be my two point grid or a two point perspective lines. I can also have my one point perspective lines. And this just makes it a little bit easier to do perspective objects because now you don't have to draw each and every line back to its associated vanishing point. You can kind of guesstimate in between these lines or in between these lines and it'll be close enough. So what I want you to do for part of your assignment is to draw a street scene. All right, and that street scene has to have at least, this is at a minimum, there is no maximum, one one point object and at least one two point object. Right, so that we're still just dealing with one point and two point, we're just deepening the conversation around how to deal with one point and two point. Right, and that street scene, drawing number one, is gonna be what's referred to as a master, right, your master shot. It's basically just the widest frame possible outlining right, where it is that things are gonna be happening. So a really extreme way of doing this would be to say, all right, you start with a wide shot of planet Earth, right? And then you zoom in a little bit and then on planet Earth, you're on a particular continent. And then as you zoom in a little bit more inside that continent, you're in a particular state, you're in a particular city, you're in a particular neighborhood, you're in a particular house, you're in a particular room, you're in a particular person's eye, head, whatever, right? You can funnel down in, right? To that particular thing. Point is, is that your master shot starts that conversation where things are happening. So your master shot right, is gonna be a street scene. And you can draw this predominantly in two point, predominantly in one point, doesn't matter to me, right? As long as you have both a one point object and a two point object present inside that scene. Okay, so the whole point of this master shot is laying out the playing field of where things are happening. So if I wanna be looking at a particular apartment block, for example, right? And inside that apartment block, there's a series of windows, right? And then in front of that apartment block, you know, there's a sidewalk and there's a lamppost, right? And crosswalks and all of that jazz, all the shit that goes into a city. We now got an idea of how all of those things relate to each other. Okay, so now let's say that we take a character, right, and we put a character here in that window. And we take another character and we put a character there. Leaning up, to, leaning up against the lamppost. What I'm going to ask you to do, right, as right, a part of another part of the street scene is to use this street scene to create a short little narrative. 
And the first part of that narrative is going to be your master shot. Laying this stuff out in this particular way. So let's just pretend that I've drawn that whole thing again here. Now let's call this character A and let's call this character B. If I was to ask you, right, who's more powerful in this scene, character A or character B, what's your answer? A. A. Why? Because he's higher up. He's higher up, that's it. Right. So when we say, like, if you look up to something or you look up to somebody, right, or you look down upon something or somebody, it's exactly the same thing with the camera. And for the most part, there are exceptions. Right. So if you put a character higher above the horizon line or lower below the horizon line, your audience is in effect interpreting that character as if they're lower than or higher than themselves. So they're physically forced to interpret them that way. Right? So that makes that character feel more powerful, feel weaker. So even if you include characters inside the same frame, position inside the frame starts to determine character relationships between each other. So because there's only two characters in this story, right, we've now developed right, a psychological relationship between these characters for your audience. Character A and character B are related to each other somehow, and character A is in a position of dominance over character B. Okay, so all of that gets communicated just by showing things this particular way. And this is, you know, part of the power of controlling imagery. Is that you can show things as opposed to telling people things. So drawing number two. One page of your assignment is going to be to show me this drawing just by itself. Another page of your assignment right, is going to be to take this thing. Right, and let's say, so let's call this drawing number one of your assignment. Drawing number two of your assignment is going to be that master shot. Okay, so you can just photocopy this, Photoshop it, right, put it on a different piece of paper, it doesn't matter. And I'm gonna ask you to crop this thing in the, in the ways that I've now right, kind of foreshadowed towards. Your first crop is going to be this. That's your high crop. Right, so drawing number two is going to be drawing number one with this thing drawn in over top of it. You know, the easiest way to do this is in Photoshop. Now, there were rumors, dirty, vile, rumors circulating um, before this term started that you guys were going to get some sort of like introductory crash, crash course towards Photoshop. Did that happen? Mm -hmm. I mean, we have had fun. some classes on Photoshop. Okay. So the question that I want to ask is like, do you know with your uh, familiarity with Photoshop, how to take an image into Photoshop and then superimpose a rectangle over top of it? Yeah, I think we can do it. Okay, great. That's all that I need to know. Right? If you can't do that, you can do this hand-drawn style. Doesn't matter to me. Right? And you can draw this on a tablet as well. That's totally fine too. I do stress though, and I'll go over this again at the end of class. It does have to be hand-drawn. This is a drawing class, so you're not using tools. Right? Straight line tools, prefabricated shapes, right, etc. Other than for the frame. Okay, so drawing number two. Right? So this is page number one. This is page number two. Page number three is going to be this thing, right, at this size. And then you're gonna blow this drawing number two up to the exact same size as drawing number one, so that these things are the same visual size next to each other. And so when I reorient that, I have now, throwing that drawing and that character into a high crop. So drawing number one is your master or frame number one rather is your master. Frame number two is your high crop. There should be no surprises is what's coming next.
frame number three is your low crop. So in page number two, you're gonna superimpose that frame over top of that master to show me where that thing is. And again, the important part in both of these is that the horizon line is not inside. This is the only way that you can screw this up. Right? So with your high crop, the horizon line's below. With your low crop, your horizon line's above. So when I take that third drawing, or that third crop, rather, and then redraw it or rather just cut and paste that out right and put it on a different piece of paper i've now exposed that character leaning up against that lamppost in that scene so now i've got a low crop so whereas here i've got character a up here and character b down here and this already establishes a position of dominance versus diminutiveness here what this does, and this is typical in terms of a sequential progression, this exaggerates that. This now makes this character feel even more powerful because now that's the only way that that character is being shown. And this character even more weak because that's the only way that that character is being shown. And to further exaggerate that, these things are shown directly after each other so that the contrast between these two scenes exaggerates the effective power relationships between them. It becomes immediately apparent to your audience that this character is in control and this character is, for all intents and purposes, fucked. Okay, so what you've basically done here is created three drawings out of a single drawing. Right? And to further this, the last thing that you're going to do is this. You're now going to impose another frame over top of that and then draw that thing in again, over top of these. It doesn't matter if the frames overlap with each other. It doesn't matter if these frames are of different sizes from each other either. What does matter is that they're all in a three to four aspect ratio. Because when I reorient this frame, right, now this drawing looks something like this. Right, where that horizon line itself has been angled in relationship to the frame. And the whole point of doing a Dutch is to destabilize. And you might do that for, again, the same variety of reasons. You might be destabilizing the geography, right? So an eruption just handed, or ha happened, an explosion just happened. Right, right. Something just crashed into a building. Somebody just got hit by a car. Right, a tsunami is coming down or coming down the pipe. It might be psychological destabilization. The original version of the Joker, Adam West style. Every time that that character was introduced, was always in a Dutch tilt to show that that fucking character is cuckoo for cocoa puffs. Right, right. You basically these are different ways of making things feel less familiar and, as a result, more psychologically exciting. And there's a wide variety of reasons why you might want to do that, but it's single-handedly the easiest way of doing it because you don't have to do any fancy perspective or any or fancy imagining in order to do it. You take a simple perspective drawing, crop it because you're aware of this as an, app, as an option, right? and now all of a sudden you've got a more exciting image right, based on this. They do this shit all the time in movies, by the way, especially in fight sequences. Right? It's like if they want like, you know, there's like when two armies, like that old chestnut, where they start, start start coming and crashing together with each other, right? Well, as soon as they have that impact, what you inevitably have, right? And just go back and watch some sort of sequence where this happens and freeze frame it, right? At some point, you've got some asshole with a camera whose job is basically this. <laughs> it just swings the camera around, right? For a little bit, right? And it creates visual chaos. It creates emotional chaos. It creates action, right? That's essentially what a Dutch is doing okay so let's say that this is all that you're responsible for for your assignment right with this right but this doesn't do much in terms of developing a story 
But let's say that I introduce right, another couple of panels to this. Let's say I reintroduce this master shot. Right, but now I have character B walk out into the street. Right, and then I cut to this. And then I reintroduce that master shot again. And now character B is lying there with character A twirling their mustache up here. What does this scene imply has happened? Car crash. Something, right? Something shitty for character B, right? Character's been hit by a car. Character's had a heart attack, right? Meteor might have struck him and bounced off screen. Who knows, right? The point is, is that you've done one drawing and you've made a nice tight little six panel story and you haven't had to show anything for film purposes anyway, expensive, right? You haven't had to show a car crash. You haven't had to have something explode. Right? You haven't had to show a meteor and animate that shit. Right? First couple seasons of Game of Thrones, for example, right, did this really well. Right? Where they cut around all the expensive stuff because they didn't have money to do it. Right? It's only until season three or four where they started backing up dump trucks full of money and said, here, fucking make things. Please go do it. Right? But go back and if you go back and watch that, and if you haven't watched it yet, I envy you the experience of watching the first seven and a half seasons of it. Um, Go back and watch the first couple of seasons, right? Where people are getting ready for battles, right? And then people come back from battles. That's it, right? It's like, they're putting on the armor. It's like, what's happening? Oh, we're fighting so-and-so, right? Cut, they're coming back. I was like, what happened? We won, we lost. <laughs> That's it, they cut around the battle. They cut around all the expensive shit because they didn't have money to do it, right? It's only when you have money that you're able to do it. So this is not only a really effective way of telling story and letting the audience fill in the gaps, it's also a very effective way of limiting the amount of work that you have to do, right? So to put that in perspective, a good friend of mine is a storyboard artist and we were having a conversation outside my studio one day. And I'm like, yeah, shooting the shit. It's like, you know, how's work going? He's like, yeah, not bad. I got a deadline coming up, big job. Yeah, it's like, it's like 900 drawings. I'm like, when's it due? Friday, it's Tuesday. Mm -hmm. Now, granted the drawings are only this big compared to my hand, but it's 900 of them. Right. And 900 of anything is a lot of work. Right. So anything that you can do to cut down that amount of work for yourself. is a good thing. I, mean, I don't give a shit how much you like drawing. Doing 900 drawings in four days is not an easy task. No. Okay, so, okay. So there's a there's a cash value aspect to it. Right. Both in terms of like the theoretical value of this, but also the practical value of this. Okay, so I'm going to go over this again, right, in relationship to your assignment when it comes time to talk about it. But this is page one of your assignment, or this is one part of your assignment, is that master shot. Another part of your assignment is that master shot cropped in three different ways, right? And then another part of your assignment is showing all four of those crops next to each other sequentially, right? So you're, rather than having, I mean, you can label them like this, but ideally what I'd like to see them as is just lined up next to each other like this. One, two, three, four. Okay, so a little bit more practice drawing a one point and two point. Oh, yeah. Um, so again, you have to have a one point in here as well. Make sure that you do whatever that thing is. It doesn't matter to me, All right? But, you know. If you need to put something in there, great. That corner gets a mailbox. An enormous mailbox by the looks of things, but let's make that a little bit more reasonable. Right. But at least that fulfills the characteristics of that assignment or that portion of the assignment. Okay, any questions about that? Um, the assignment is pretty forward. I just didn't get the second one but that you said, like we have to crop it. This thing? Yeah, like, so it's think like... This thing, you're just taking this initial drawing uh -huh. and make a copy of it. Okay, so duplicate that file. If you're doing this, like if you scan this in, you'll have the original of this. Duplicate that file. Okay. Right? So you've got two versions of the same thing. On that duplicated version, you're going to draw in these crop lines over top of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, so that's do, the second part. Do we draw all of them in one file or separate files? No, all of them oh, on yeah. one file. Okay, yeah, so. got it. 
Drawing number one is this. Drawing number two is that with those things cropped in. Okay. Okay, so they're basically the same, except there's no crop lines in that. And then part number three is all four of those crops, master, high crop, low crop, Dutch, lined up alongside each other. Do we redraw the crops for number three or just like blow them up? You can if you want, I don't recommend it. There are three okay. different ways of doing this assignment. You can draw this, redraw the whole damn thing, right? And draw the crops over them and then redraw all the crops. There's not time or world enough to do that, right? There are more interesting things to do with your life. Yeah. Another option is to draw this, photocopy it, right? And then physically draw out or and print out a version of that, right? Or scan it and print out a version of that and hand draw these crops over top of it. Right? And then cut out those, well, that doesn't even make any sense. The way that you <laughs> do this, right, is just scan drawing number one, create this in Photoshop, cut and paste all three of these things out of here, right, and then on a separate piece of paper, resize all of them so that they all share the same visual size and are all in the same aspect ratio. Okay. Okay. So then, I mean, pretty limited in terms of what you need to do in Photoshop in order to do this. So yeah. if you can draw that rectangle and cut and paste and resize, you're more than good enough. Right? And if you don't know how to do that, I'm happy to just show you really quickly afterwards. And then do you want the same uh, level of detail as the house or just like the basic shapes? Good question. Okay, so this comes back to the way that you're graded. And I don't wanna to spend too much time on this, right? Because there is one more thing that takes a bit of unpacking for me to go over, right? But how much detail, how much stuff that you put into your picture, now this is where your creativity and line quality do start to play a bigger role. Right, so you can fulfill the objective of the assignment just by doing the mass shape stuff, right, that we did in the last assignment, right, those basic shapes, right, because whether these are boxes, right, or high rises that are right, incredibly detailed, you can get across the same basic idea as long as the perspective is accurate. But how much time and effort did it take you to do those things? Right, that's where the difference lies. Okay, so. I'm going to let you make that calculus or do that calculus for yourself. But the, I think the three or the four of you that handed in your assignments, right, relatively early in the week, right, which allowed me an opportunity to look at them, you know, those both had high degrees of creativity and effort and line quality in the final product. Ideally, that's what I want to see, right, because it's more interesting for me to see. But I also know for a fact that it pushes you continually further in terms of developing your ability to draw and design things. Now, that being said, for those of you who don't want to do that because you're interested in other things, you don't have to, but it will have consequences here, right, in terms of 60% of your grade. Okay, but we'll go over that again, right, when it comes time. Okay, so there's one other aspect of your assignment that I need to go over, right, and this is, this is the horizon, this is a good, this is a very good screen to, uh, or a page to screenshot, considering that it's, a part of your assignment, but also a nice um, dehydrated version of an introduction to all of this upshot downshot stuff. The other one is more specifically related to horizon line variation in a technical sense, right? Cropping is an easy way of varying the horizon line, right? Simply by just moving the frame around. Right. But horizon line variation, if you don't have that option, right, refers to, let's say that we've got a person standing here. It's my amazing drawing of a person. You're welcome. Why? No. Oh, that's not going to be good. Got a lag going on here. Anyway, whatever. Let's say that we've got a person. Right, and that person is standing on, as we all do, a ground plane. Right? As I've mentioned right, um, 
peripherally beforehand. Is it lagging for you guys or yeah, is it there's just a lot of lag um, actually? Yeah. Frozen on our end, or at least on my end. Why are you lagging, you heap of shit? Hold on a second. Let me check what's going on with my camera here. Oh, that's all. On the wrong network. No. Yeah. Oh, it even kicked me out. Kicked me out of my own meeting. <laughs> Facts. There I am again. Bam. Hi. <laughs> yeah. There. The uh, correct network is Cat's Rule. I was not on Cat's Rule. So much I love the name of the network. It's my name of the network, yeah. I, I, don't, fuck I don't fuck around with cats here, dude. <laughs> the one thing I'm serious about in life, it's cats. Okay, this should, that should be better. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so as I've obliquely remember or mentioned, or at least in passing mentioned um, in previous classes, your ground plane, when we're in one point and two point, runs parallel to your horizon line, eye level, indefinitely. These things never hook up with each other, right? That's literally definitive of what one point and two point are. Okay. So what that means is that each horizon line that you have in one point and two point is gonna have a value. What that value signifies is the distance of the horizon line eye level from the ground plane. Right, so GP for sure. Now it doesn't matter what unit of measurement you're using in order to describe that distance. Right, so for those of you who are on Imperial, like weirdly I was raised because this is a metric country, um, you know, you're gonna be more familiar with feet and inches. Right, for those of you who have leapfrogged into the 21st century and embraced a metric system, right, those are gonna be meters and centimeters, decimeters, right, et cetera. It doesn't matter if it's any one of those things. These units of measurement, we could literally just call them units. We could call them Bob for all that matters, right? What matters is that if I say that the value of this horizon line is six, right? And I'm just gonna say that that's six feet because this is inevitably as try as I may, I will always revert back to this rather than calling it units, right? Or, you know, two meters. All that matters is that there's six of an individual thing between here and there, right? So try to think about it as six units when I inevitably start calling it feet, right, at some point. So that means that the halfway point between here and here, that's gonna be three units, right? And then you can break that up, right, into individual one unit, chunks that are all equal to each other. Okay, so I've got a one unit chunk, a two unit chunk, a four unit chunk, five unit chunk. And the purpose of varying the horizon line is that I can show objects from this, this viewpoint, right? Again, what we're calling our POV, right? Your point of view, right? But I can also equally show it from this point of view. And likewise, I could show it from this point of view. So with respect to say the Ratatouille example, if any of you have seen this movie, the whole point of me introducing that as an example was that you have three different worldviews in that example. You have the Linguini character who is just a regular viewpoint of that, or of that world. You have the head chef character who has a typical stereotypical small man syndrome, right? Where everything looks much bigger and irritating because everything's kind of an obstacle that's in the way, right? With that character. And then you have the rat character, right? Where everything now feels big, dangerous, threatening to that character. So if I put a box in here, for example, and say that it's that high, how tall is that box? Four units. Four units, 
But importantly, for the Linguini character, there's going to be two units of space and then four units of stuff. But that's all going to be below his horizon line, his eye level. For the chef character, there's going to be one unit of stuff above and three units of stuff below. But for the rat character, there's going to be one unit of stuff below and three units of stuff above. So what that means is that that object is going to look radically different. And more importantly for us, it's going to feel radically different for each one of those characters. So your job and your assignment right, is going to make those objects right, or a simple object look the same in terms of its visual size, its visual appearance, but make it feel different depending on its relationship to the horizon line and the ground plane. And this is the bit that takes a bit of unpacking. So if we take that character, and we establish their horizon line, eye level, and ground plane. And I say that this horizon line here is the exact same horizon line as what we've been dealing with perspectively, except now we're looking into a perspective field, right? Where lines are receding towards particular points, both above and below the horizon line, be it in one point or in two point. This horizon line, again, to reiterate, is intersecting the curvature of the earth at a particular point. This is that particular point. Right, so we have this phenomenon because of this intersection of a straight line versus a curved surface. Now, what this means is that anything that we, or anything inside of this, or sorry, anything that drops below the horizon line inside this perspective field, we're going to assume is attached to the ground plane. Right, so we assume that it's resting on the ground. So we're basically, we're removing, we're removing the possibility of things floating in the air, right, to simplify the conversation. So that means if I put mark A here and mark B here and mark C here, we know from looking at this in a simplified profile version that all of these marks are getting further away from the viewer. As we get closer towards the horizon line, things are getting further away from our viewer as well. They're just doing so perspectively. Okay. But if I say that this, this horizon line value is six units. Because this is equidistant away from this, regardless of how far away you get, how far is mark A, B, and C away from the horizon line? Six. Six. That means that if I draw a stick from mark A and bring it up to the horizon line, and a stick from mark B and bring it up to the horizon line and same thing with C and have those all level with the horizon line. How tall are each one of those sticks? They're the same. They're all the same. They're all six. Okay. And I know this because they all share the similar relationship. It's exactly the same here. Right. The bit of the mind fuck that goes along with this, right. Is that it doesn't look the same. Right. Cause you've got things receding. Right. When you're dealing with perspective, everything recedes, everything gets smaller, everything gets closer together. So if I put mark A here and mark B here and mark C here, all of these we know are attached to the ground plane, they're on the ground. So they're the same as these. So how far away from the horizon line are each one of these marks? Six. Six. They're exactly the same. 
right? The distance, regardless of how much space there looks like there is between these marks and the horizon line, is always the same, assuming that these things are on the ground plane. So that means if I draw a stick here and here and here and bring it up and touch the horizon line, how tall are each one of those sticks? Six. Six. Six units. That's it. Right. So this is basically the nut of the point. Visual size does not equal scale. What you need in order to establish scale and the size of a particular thing is have a relationship. And by relationship, I mean that that object has to drop below the horizon line between the ground plane and the horizon line. So some of any object has to drop below the horizon line in order for me to establish how big it is. So if I draw these hills off in the background of my stick field, how tall are those, how tall are those hills? More than six. Definitely more than six, but can you tell exactly how? You can tell mm -hmm. the deep six, no. why can't you tell how, those, how big those are? Because it doesn't mm -hmm. go below the horizon line. Because it doesn't go below the horizon line. What you're effectively viewing there is this, right? When I mentioned that the other class, you're viewing stuff so big that you can see it even though it's more than five meters oh. away, right? It's so big that it pops up over the curvature of the earth. You cannot see people from five kilometers away. I dare you to try. And at the same time, try to throw a baseball till the end of time and see how well that goes. Okay, so basically what you're dealing with here is something of geologic proportions. So if I drop those hills below the horizon line, like that, let's say they're uniform distance below the horizon line. And I just ask you at this particular point right here, how tall is that hill? Can you answer that question now? Do we know well, if it's how big, behind the point? How big is this space? This is the base of the hill. How big is this space right here? Six units. Six. So if I double that here, how big is this space now? 12 units. So how tall is that hill-ish? 20-ish. It's okay, a little so over 18. 12, 18. 26, 25, 26. The point is, it doesn't really matter how big it is. The point is that now you have a way to establish how big it is, right? Because this object drops below the horizon. Oh, yeah. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah. Uh, no. Okay. Where did it stop making sense? Um, when you draw the line below the horizon, horizon line. Okay, well, let's explain this in a different way then. Let's go back to sticks. Okay. If I put mark D here and I put mark D there, how far away from the horizon line is mark D? Six. Six, okay. Yeah. Now, if I draw stick D here, mm. how big is stick D? Three. Okay, how do you know that? Because it's half the person. It's half the distance. All right. So if I want to draw a three-foot stick here, how do I do that? You, you draw it like three units below the horizon line. Yeah. You know that this whole thing is six. Half of six is three. There's your three-foot stick. Okay. So let's go in the other direction. Let's say I put a stick here. Mm -hmm. Right, and I call that stick E. How tall is stick E? 12. 12. How do you know that? It's double the distance. Double the distance, right? So let's say that I put mark E here. How much space is between mark E and the horizon line? Six. So if I draw a stick like this, that's how tall? Six. 
How do I draw a 12 foot stick? You draw another six on top. So how tall right now, if this is the base of this hill mm -hmm. and I'm measuring from here to here, about how tall is that hill at that point? 14, 15. There you go. Well, how do you know uh, the distance between the bottom of the hill to the horizon line? You mean where, you mean, how do I know where to put this? Um, yeah, kind of, I guess. I just decided I can put it anywhere I want, right? Just like I decided to put that stick there. I decided to put that hill there. I'm not sure if I'm, I'm not sure if I'm asked, you're answering the same or if I, I'm answering the question. Though. Right. So. So for the sticks, they were uh, relative to the distance of the person, like the horizon line. But for the hill, how do you know that the the distance that you put there is equal to the like the distance of the person that is looking? Okay, well, let's put it this way. It's like, so the bottom of the hill, right, is a little bit further away than the bottom of the stick here, right? Yeah. Okay, so let's just say that the hill starts here. Mm -hmm. Okay, just a little bit further away. Here, let's just say that this hill, this portion of the hill is 18 feet tall. That hill is going to come up like that. There's six, there's 12, there's 18. Okay, now it makes sense. Okay. That makes sense? Yeah, yeah. When, when I see like both of them, one from the side and one from the perspective, okay. it makes more sense. Yeah, this is it. This is by far the hardest thing that we'll ever have to do with perspective, right? And the perspective doesn't change. The perspective's easy, right? Because it's the same shit, right? What's difficult is trying to figure out that what the fuck do you mean things that are different sizes are the same size? What do you mean that small things are bigger than small, small things are bigger than big things? It doesn't make any sense, right? Because I can put in, right? let's say that I do this, let's ignore the hill. Right? And I just put in another mark that's really close to the horizon line there. And I put in this stick there. That stick is now going to be 6, 12, or 18, 24, 30, 36, 42, 48. Let's call it 54 feet tall. Right? But this stick is 6, six feet tall. But if I took this stick here, and put it next to that stick, just in terms of like their visual size inside that field, this thing's way bigger than that thing. But because this thing's so much closer to me, right, it appears bigger, right? Just like holding this thing here, like that, as opposed to here, like that, right? It would be deeply unpleasant if I taught this class like this all the time. <laughs> Although avant-gardedly weird and fun. Maybe I should start doing that. Start doing fucked up shit with my camera where I was like, I'm just forcing you guys to look at me in like some sort of like <laughs> <laughs> have, have continual a continual stream of visual effects behind me so that I look more like the shit that everybody consumes on a daily basis. Okay, does this make sense to everybody? Okay, what I'm gonna ask, what I want you to do, right, for your assignment. Whoa, I almost lost my computer. That would be good. I'll go back to that and let you screenshot it, right, in a second. I want you to give me three different views of a one point and a three point object. So this is the fourth part of your assignment. You're gonna give me a two point and a one point object. From three different horizon line values. Six units, three units, and one unit. Now, the easiest way to do this, this assignment is to do this, right? This, by the way, is one of those instances 
that you do not have to have a frame around your drone. This is sheerly a technical exercise. Easiest way to do this. Establish all three horizon lines directly on top of each other with your vanishing points directly over top of each other as well. Okay, so the easiest way to do that is drop vertical lines straight down from all of your vanishing points so that they all line up on top of each other. You don't have to do this, but this is the easiest way to do this. And let's call this the six unit one. We'll call this the three unit one. And then not surprisingly, your one unit one. Okay, now it doesn't matter to me what size your objects are, like how tall you're making your objects. It will make a difference though, in terms of how good your drawings look and how confusing the drawings are to do. So the size that you want to avoid are six unit objects, three unit objects, or one unit objects. And it doesn't matter whether or not they're one point or two point. Any one of those are bad heights. Reason being is that if I draw, say that this is my six unit one point versus my three unit one point. If I draw a six, if I draw a six foot unit or a six foot object, from a three, from a three unit perspective, or a three foot perspective, that's what it's gonna look like. It's gonna look fine. But if I try to draw right, a three or a six unit perspective from a six unit, that's what it's gonna look like. The top of that thing is gonna flatten out and you're gonna lose perspective depth. And the same thing is gonna be true for a three unit thing. If I draw a three unit thing, from six, it'll look fine. But if I draw a three unit thing from three, it's gonna look like shit again, or it's gonna look weird. This is what's called visual transitioning. And basically it makes the objects really confusing for people to interpret, right? Because they're not quite sure where one thing stops, the horizon line, and another thing starts, the object. So this is something to avoid because one of the things that you're gonna experience when you get into film is that you're gonna be dealing with different higher horizon line values as you expose the viewpoint of different characters, right? Linguini, chef, rat, right? And the objects, as you cut between those different uh, viewpoints, those objects need to look good from each individual horizon line height or eye level height, right? You can't have your set looking great from here, but looking like shit from here, right? Or vice versa from any direction. Okay, so make sure that you're avoiding these kinds of points of view. Okay, now it doesn't matter to me, again, what height your objects are. And so let's just, I always do this. I'm just gonna arbitrarily draw and I just did what I asked you not to do. Thanks. I'm gonna make that thing that big. I'm gonna make this thing this big. All right, and now my job is to transfer those things to both of these drawings, have them be the same visual size, right? But not move left or right, not zoom in or out, right? But now have them look the way that they would to a three unit or a one unit POV. Now, in order to do this, where you have to break these things down into what's called the base scale unit. This is what it'll be in your handout. It's basically your lowest common denominator. So lowest common denominator between all three of these things is one. Right? So we've made it easy. So what that means is that the distance from the base of this object to here 
Okay, so the ground, and we're assuming that this is on the ground because it drops below the horizon line. How big is this space here from the base of the ground to the horizon line? Two, two and a half. How big is it from the ground to the horizon line in a six unit POV? Six units. Six units. Oh, yeah, six units. Okay, so this object, right, then is how tall ish? About seven units. Nope. So this is six. How big is this? Right. Uh, like 15. Yeah. So let's call that thing 15. All we need to know is this space underneath the horizon line. So if I want to divide that up into three, that's easy. I just divide that in half. And then if I want to divide that space up, fucking phone calls. <laughs> And if I want to divide that space up into individual one foot units, that's how big those one foot units are at that point. Right. So if I zoom in on that, that's easier to see. What I'm doing is basically making sure that each one of these little spaces here is all equal. So that I'm now counting up by ones rather than one big six foot chunk. And I can equally, you know, now just continue to count up by ones as well to get to 12 and then eventually to get to 15. That makes sense? Yep. The, exact, the exact same thing happens here, except this, that size is gonna be a bit different, right? Because this thing's closer to me, which means that that base scale unit is gonna get bigger. So the distance from here to here, from the ground to the horizon line is how much? Six. Six. Half of that is three. Divide that up into equal chunks. Right, so I've got about a two foot, two unit object. Now the difference between these things, right, is that here you're gonna have six below and nine above. Here, I've got four feet of empty space and then two chunks of object. Here, if I move this object here, the easiest way to do this is to drag these vertical lines down. That way I know that that thing's not shifting left or right. Again, you don't have to do this, but this just takes out the guesswork. Same thing here, just drag these vertical lines down. Your job when you try to transfer this thing to here, right, is to make sure only the amount that you are drawing is below the horizon line. So you want three of these units below the horizon line. If that's the case for a 15 unit object, how many, how many units are below the horizon line and how many units are above? Three and 12. Three and 12. So all you've got to do to begin with, and you can do this from any side, but it's easiest from the front, is like, I'm going to take one of those units and put it below the horizon line. And then I'm just gonna count down till I get to three. And now I'm just gonna count up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. And what you should get, right, is a rectangle that looks exactly the same size as that rectangle. Except now you've got three below and 12 above. And now, because you've got these vertical lines over there, it's business as usual in terms of completing that perspective object. That's it. So importantly, that thing should look like it's the same visual size, but it should start to feel different. Because you've got more stuff above the horizon line, your audience is now, again, remember that your horizon line is synonymous with an audience's eye level. There is more stuff above them. So that thing starts to feel more dominant. Now, likewise, what's the first thing that you need to do with this object to get this here? Draw the three points below the horizon line. Okay, so I know how big that chunk of space is. That chunk of space is now different than these chunks of spaces because this object is in a different recessive position. So now I've got one chunk, 
two chunk, three chunk. Once I've established those chunks, I don't need to do any more measuring because the perspective takes care of the rest of it for me. This is why it's so important that your perspective lines go to the correct spots because I know that this distance here is the same as this distance there because that's what perspective does. It controls the scale relationship between the front and the back of that object. Okay, so you're gonna have one chunk of empty space here as opposed to four chunks and two chunks of stuff. All right, so let's do this one. Again, just dragging the vertical lines down. How do I get this thing or this thing down here? You shift it up by two units. Okay, so what does that mean? What is what's how many how much stuff is going to be below the horizon line? So for the small one, one point is below, one point is high up. Exactly, right? So this value here, that chunk of space stays the same. And I have an equal amount above. So that's what my two unit box looks like from a one foot perspective. What about here? You shift it up again, so one unit is below and then 14 units up. Yeah, so same chunk of space. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. All right, so you start to, hopefully you start to see it's like the value of raising and lowering the horizon line. Whereas this now even feels more dominant, right? feels bigger, feels more impressive. The important thing is not, it's not getting bigger. It's not getting closer to you. You're not increasing the size of the object. You're changing the relationship of the audience to the object. And as a result, that thing is getting bigger or sorry, feeling bigger. Okay, so that's a nice example of the last part of your assignment. You know, there is a step-by-step -step breakdown of this in your handout as well, but you'll also have the recorded version of this lecture right, to go back over as well. If this makes sense right now, I can almost guarantee you that this will stop making sense when you start doing it. If you do any part of the assignment soon rather than later, my very strong recommendation would be to do this first, right, while it's fresh, right? Because if it does make sense theoretically, until you start bludgeoning your head against the wall of this experience, and have it start to kind of like sink in, it will probably take a bit. Some of you will get it pretty quickly. I know for me, this took this took a while to make sense of. Right? Now, I've done it so many times, I don't think about it, right? But at the beginning, I remember how uncomfortable that experience was. Right? So just make it a little bit easier on yourself. Uh, same question as the other part. Do you, do you want like an actual object or a shape? Or is it? Um, I just want you to do two boxes. Okay. Just okay. Two boxes. Yeah, super simple. The objective of this is not to turn these things into pretty drawings. The objective of this is to understand how to raise and lower a horizon line and keep objects in the same scale relationship. Okay, so limit the amount of time that you're spending on this. And an easier way of doing this as well is limit how big the object is. Right? Like, don't do a 200 foot object. And it's for obvious reasons. Okay, so screenshot this, because right, that's one part of your assignment. All right, and I'll flip back and give you that previous, I will. I will flip back a piece of paper. There's nothing you can do about it. I am the master of your universe. I'll rip you the fuck out the pad if I want to. Holy Christ, really putting up a fight today. Frisky. Okay, so you can screenshot that guy too.
Okay, do you guys want me to uh, recap your assignment by showing you the uh, handout and the examples of the assignment first? Or do you want to look at examples first? Examples first. All right. Let's see if we can find this shit. <laughs> if you haven't seen this movie i highly recommend that you see this movie i won't say this about a lot of films but this is basically a perfect film right and almost everything that brad bird has uh put his hands to falls into the same category there are also certain directors that you should see um, this is also something that i should preface the rest of the class with I will spend a fair amount of time in this class calling movies pieces of shit and this is dumb and this is garbage, right? While I'm showing you examples from that movie, it's important to understand why I'm saying those things, right? Is that first off, I'm saying that because it's true. Those movies are pieces of shit, right? But you can learn a lot of stuff, right? From watching movies that in general are pretty shitty, right? But do certain things really, really well, right? And there's no end to these things. It's very rare that you come across a movie that does everything really, really well, right? Um, this is just happens to be one of those rare beasts, right? Where this is, for the most part, a pretty much a perfect film, right? In every way that you can talk about film, regardless of whether or not you like cartoons or animation. Like my wife, for example, she hates cartoons. She won't watch them, right? And it's like, it's, that's fucking crazy talk to me. It's like, cartoons are amazing movies, some of them. Okay, so we're not going to watch every single bit of this, right? You can go back and I'll, I'll save this clip and like and put it in um, an email for you guys. The important parts of this are this, right? When we watch this poor little bastard run around here, right, inside of a kitchen, this is what everything feels like for this little guy. So when we take on this perspective, Right. As the audience, we start to identify with that character, right, with their point of view of the world, right, and with their emotional state of being, right, and this becomes particularly effective as we cut from what we will call, say, a third person perspective to a first person perspective where we now are that rat, right, we the audience have now taken on that life threatening position right, of that cat or of that rat, it becomes a very effective way of showing what a character is experiencing and then inserting the audience so that they identify with that character, right? From their perspective, everything feels dangerous. Everything feels like it might end their life, right? And in any particular moment. So it's not just an aesthetic decision when you're changing, when you're changing perspective, although it can be. So I need to find a new clip now. She likes the zoo. That's my favorite part of this movie. Celine Leclerc, Celine Leclerc, what did she say? She likes the soup. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so for instance, oh, this isn't it. There. Got an ad blocker, you bastards. How did you find a way around it? Okay, so now you get a regular person's point of view, right? Everything feels normal outside of that a rat is cooking right, in this sequence. Right, so from this person's perspective, the same kitchen feels entirely different because it just looks like a kitchen. Nothing's life-threatening about it, right? Everything's just regular. And then when we shift to <laughs> when we shift to this person's perspective, this person's perspective, right, is right, everything's in the way, everything's irritating. He's got this stupid little step ladder that he needs to use, right, in order to right, in order to see anything, do anything. You get the stereotypical small man syndrome, 
right, version. All right, so, yeah, right here. That's a nice example, right? Where this character is forced by virtue of their stature to look up at everything, right? As opposed to looking down on things the way that these characters will. Forced to do shit like this. <laughs> Where is it? What did the customer say? It was not a customer. It was a critic. Eagle? Celine Leclerc. Leclerc. What did she say? She likes a soup. <laughs> 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 she likes a soup. I can watch that all day. <laughs> If I could make that my ringtone, I would. It'd be amazing. Okay, so hopefully that gives like a little bit of right, cash value as to why right, we're raising and lowering the horizon line. Right? It's not just about making aesthetic decisions, right? In terms of like making things look better or worse, although that is part of it, I'm not gonna deny. It. The bigger part of it is you're literally telling a different story. Right, from a different perspective, making those worlds fe feel entirely different right, when you make those decisions. Okay, now that being said, let's uh, take a look at your, your handout right, and um, solidify anything that might approximate a misunderstanding of your assignment. So this is all the nuts and bolts of blah, 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 the shit that we've just done, right? Breakdown of how to do those things, introduction to high crop and low crop, right? As well as dutching things, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so that's a word version. That's a text version of the shit that came out of my face today. Here's a written version of all the things that I've asked you to do, right? Now I basically did, I basically did the assignment in reverse, right? Because that's the order that things came out of my face today, but it's the exact same order or it's the exact same assignment. So whether or not you order them the way that they are in the assignment or whether or not you order the, in the handout or whether or not you order them in the way that I wrote them down, doesn't really matter to me, as long as you've got the same content. What your assignment should look like, right? There's your two different perspective objects from three different horizon line values, six foot, one foot, three foot, six unit, one foot, or one unit, three unit, doesn't matter what you call it. Master shot, right? So you've got your overall version, right? In two point, the only downside to this um, assignment is that there's no one point object in it. So please make sure that you uh, put a one point object inside that picture, right? Next one is the exact same shot, but you're superimposing those three different crops over top of that master drawing, making sure that with your high crop and your low crop, that you're cropping the horizon line out of the frame. Horizon line is below the frame in your high crop. Horizon line is above the frame in your low crop. Okay, Dutch doesn't matter. And then your last page is those three things or those four things put together sequentially at the exact same scale ratio, the exact same size. Okay, so that should make it crystal clear. Also, please make sure that your aspect ratio for all of these crops is exactly the same. They're all in three to four. They're just smaller versions of three to four that all should be three to four of the same visual size when we get to the final part of your assignment. Okay. Um, that's all the things that need to come out of my face today officially. Now, oh, one other thing. These. These are due next Friday, right, by 1 p.m. Okay, so you've got still a full week to do these things. That being said, we do have class again on Monday. Right? You will be getting another assignment on Monday, right? That assignment will be due the following Monday, right? So you'll still have a full week to do those things, but please be right, very aware of the amount of time that you're going to have to do these things, right? You still have, you know, two assignments due in a week and a half, right? Unfortunately, but 
another victim of the Commonwealth. Made up holidays, that's what we get for them. To redo our assignment, uh, how should we do that? Okay, so good question. Redos, if you're doing a redo, you can, do, you can redo every assignment that we do in this class once, okay? And you have until the end of term in order to do that. If you're gonna do a redo, please email it to me, to my at VFS, right? And the file name should be the assignment number underscore redo, right? Underscore your name, okay? Dot PDF, the whole, the whole jazz. So that I know who it belongs to, what assignment it's referring to, and the fact that you're doing a redo and you're not just emailing me an assignment that I've currently assigned. Okay. All right. My very strong suggestion for redos, if you're going to go down that track, is well, twofold. Please do not leave them to the last second. Everybody always thinks that, you know, at the end of term, they're going to catch up, right, and do all these things. You will not because right? you're going to have an avalanche of assignments that are due at the end of every term for other classes, including this one, right? Trying to redo seven other assignments, it's not going to happen, right? And at the very least, right, at the best case scenario, you'll probably, if you try and do that, you'll just do a shitty job of them and it won't change your mark. Okay, so please be aware of your time. Secondly, the whole idea of this class and the, the redos is, to, is for me to help make you better. Right, in terms of understanding this stuff theoretically as well as the mechanical ability. Right, so show me the redo first. Ask me if it's correct. Right, I will tell you. Right, as like I would not hand that in. Right, and these are the reasons why. Right, and I'll show you how to do it properly. Right, and then show me again is this done correctly? Yes, it is. Can I improve it? Can I improve it more? Probably. Do you want to is another question, right? And I'll show you how to improve it and the amount of time that it will probably take in order for you to improve it. And we can just keep going through that conversation until you're satisfied. But at least then you know that you're gonna be handing something in that's gonna get you a better mark, right? Please don't just hand something in, expect a better mark because you've done things, you've spent more time on it. You might've just spent more time doing something incorrect in a different way. I mean, so again, please take advantage of the resource, right? And, you know, get yourself the best grade possible. You know, not that it really matters grade wise, but grades, you know, are a pretty direct reflection of how you're improving in all classes, including this one. Ultimately, the strength of your work, the strength of your education is gonna be reflected in your portfolio, right? But this will give you the best chance of making the strongest possible portfolio you can, as well as get you a good grade. I was going to add, wait until the end of the class to ask, but this brought up perfect leeway. Um, I was going to ask if after class, you could give me some feedback on my on an assignment I wanted to redo. Yeah, for sure. So when I'm uh, once I'm done, like doing the drawing and stuff like that, that's officially the end of class. The rest of the classes right is for you guys to ask questions, right, etc. Get feedback. Um, I do expect you to take advantage of that. Right. But but be proactive about that. Like, I'm not gonna ask each and every one of you, right? And force you to do that. Um, so it's good, right, that you're asking that. Also, many of you will probably have very similar questions, right? And if you would are all interested in, right, in that, it's probably a good opportunity for you to at least hang around, right? If you do have that interest, see if those questions fall into the same category, right? Or if they don't, or if they don't fall in the same category, see if they answer shit that you just didn't know before, right? As well. Um, okay. Before I have we get, a sorry. Yeah. No. Before we get into the feedback. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Um, my, com like I, I know you said to compress the file, not zip it. But whenever I click compress, like on my computer, the way like Google tells me to, it zips the file. Sorry. So, I mean, I'm, I'm using compress and somebody who's basically technically illiterate, right, as a way of making the file smaller, right? So yeah, well, if, that, that's what zip does too. But then you said 
like on my feedback that you wanted it compressed, not zipped. Yeah, so I don't want I don't want to go through multiple steps to open your assignment basically, right? So by giving me a zip, then I've got to open un, I've got to open the zip, then I've got to open the folder that the zips inside of, right? And then it's going to be in separate parts. What I want is just a file that I can open up and then it exists. Right? So what I mean by compress, right? And this is this is my fault, right? Is I want you to make sure that the image size itself is small enough that you can just send me the image as either a JPEG or a PDF. So if that requires you going into Photoshop or Acrobat, right, and then just changing the file size, that's what I want you to do. So, oh, that it's, okay. so that it's under two or five meg or whatever it is. I think for this system, it's under five meg. Okay. okay. So again, that's my bad, but it's because I don't know very much about computers. It is a fucking miracle that this exists for this guy um, and that it runs relatively smoothly. Deeply ironic, some might say, considering that I spend my ass end on the uh, my life on the ass end of these or paintbrushes or power tools. <laughs> okay, if there aren't any other general questions, are there any other general questions? General questions meaning not specific to feedback about your individual assignment. Okay, if you don't have individual questions and you don't want to stick around, you are free to go. Um, for the rest of you, um, now's your time to shine. Let's ask some questions. But this will be the end of the recording anyway.